Well, it is my absolute great pleasure to welcome to Animated Living podcast today, Dr. Hugh Mackay, Australia's preeminent social researcher, um, author of 21, or is it 22, perhaps even 23 books. Uh, and his latest book, The Kindness Revolution, got my attention. And uh, Hugh has been holding up a mirror to the face of Australians for decades, helping us understand who we are, what it means to be fully human, and who we are as a nation and where we're going and the kind of values that are going to move us forward in a positive way. Uh, so Hugh, thank you so much for coming on the Animated Living Podcast. It's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Ian. It's a pleasure for me too. And I'm grateful for your interest in the new book. And by the way, the score is 22. You were right about that. Okay. 22 <laughs> with the kindness revolution. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, uh, your books have had a great impact on me and on my thinking over decades. So when I saw this particular book being released, I thought that's a book I've got to read. And then I started the podcast and I thought, hang on, I'm going to interview Hugh Mackay if I can possibly manage to do that. Uh, let me tell you why your books have helped me. Um, just on a personal note, I think as a young adult, uh, you know, the world and how I viewed it was much about me and through my own personal lens and a lot of the issues I faced were my issues. So it's always been about me as a young adult. And then I started reading books like, I think was it Reinventing Australia, uh, yes. Understanding the Mood of the 90s. And um, in reading that, I thought, hang on, there's, there's a lot bigger picture going on here it's about our connectedness as human beings to one another it's it's what we share in common and the values that we have and how that impacts upon other people and who we are as Australians and our identity so you've helped to shape that view of myself in a collective space and in the context of my relationship with others so thank you so much for bringing that awareness to my life i think it would have been a rather selfish and egotistical path had i continued on the one i was on well thank you for saying that ian i mean it's it's very very gratifying of course uh, to hear that that sort of response to some of my work uh, but the point you've made is uh, an absolutely fundamental point about our understanding of what it means to be human. And by the way, your own journey is is a very typical journey. I mean, when we are young adults, yes. Uh, yes. we are often preoccupied with our own identity, with our own life, with our own goals, um, establishing our toehold on the planet and perhaps uh, choosing a partner, perhaps deciding whether or not to have a family, determining a career, where will I live, what sort of person am I, how will I dress. It's a, it's a very ego-driven period, typically, not, not everyone, but typically it's a very ego-driven phase of our lives. But then mm -hmm. eventually we come to realise that all of our obsession with self uh, with our personal identity is important, of course, it's significant, it, it's why the world is such an interesting place, because we are all unique, we are all different. But then it dawns on us that there's a deeper truth about us, which is far more significant, and has mm -hmm. nothing really to do with my personal identity or how Ian and Hugh are different but has mm -hmm. to do with our common humanity, the fact yes. that we yes. exist together in this vibrating web of interconnectedness and interdependency. Yes. Uh, and yes. that changes everything. That, that changes our perspective. It makes us realise that uh, we can only uh, thrive if we're connected, that, mm -hmm. that we, we need groups, families, neighbourhoods, communities of all kinds to nurture us and sustain us and to give us that all important sense of belonging, which is so fundamental to the mental and emotional health yes. of a member yes. of this species, because it is a social species. I mean, humans are hopeless in isolation. And that's why that phase of our lives is a bit, that you were referring to, is a bit, is a bit dangerous. And by the way, just to, just to put that in a broader context, I think it's important to realize that the pandemic with the lessons that it's taught us about interconnectedness and interdependency, that arrived at a time in our social history mm. and we'd been through a period as a society very much like 
the period you described in your own personal life, Ian, because if you look at what's been reshaping us and societies like us over the last 30 or 40 years, it's a series of social trends which taken together have had the effect of making us more socially fragmented, putting much more emphasis on us as individuals Mm. Uh, the so-called me culture has arisen. And this has been driven by things like our shrinking households, our high rate of relationship breakdown, our busyness, our increased mobility, our enthusiastic embrace of information technology, which like this connects us, but also makes it possible for us to stay apart. Mm. Uh, all of those things taken together and, and other trends like that have really ramped up our sense of being individuals. Mm. So there's been a lot of social dislocation, a lot of social isolation. And one of the things we know about members of a social species is that if they're isolated, they suffer. Mm. So we've seen those triple epidemics which have arisen in Australia and around the Western world, the epidemics of anxiety and depression and loneliness directly attributable to the fact that we become a more socially fragmented uh, kind of society. So um, my, my great hope is why I wrote this new book, uh, one of the reasons I wrote it, uh, my great hope is that, that we'll have had enough of a shock, enough of a circuit breaker as a result of the pandemic to cause us to say, hang on, we've been, we've been traveling at a million miles an hour in the wrong direction. You know, we've mm. been heading mm. far more in the direction of look how interesting and significant and important and special and unique I am. Mm. You know, the whole identity politics thing is, a, is another example of that. Mm. Now, perhaps we have a moment. It's, it's like a gift from the mm. pandemic, a moment to pause and reflect on the fact that, it, that, 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 isn't, that isn't the most significant thing. It's not even the most interesting thing about us. The most significant thing is what we share as humans. Yeah, and I do want to talk a little bit more about the pandemic and the lessons that you perceive that we were given opportunity to learn and whether, in fact, we have learned them. Uh, as you know, we're, we're in a fresh new lockdown now and where I am, I can't live, you know, go more than 10 kilometres. In South Australia, they can't travel more than two and a half kilometres. So we're, we're doing it all over again. But just going back to some of what you were saying there, uh, I think if we used my young adult life as a metaphor here for the nation, yes. just for a yes. short moment, uh, I define myself by my differentness, how my beliefs were different, how uh, my, my race was different, how my gender was different. And what I hear you saying is that those are, are things that, that really reflect a stage of life that hasn't come into full maturity and maturity is about appreciating our differentness and welcoming what we have in common as human beings is that that this period that you suggest australia has been in has been one where it has been all about the, or very much about the me and that this is a chance to learn more about the we is that what you're suggesting there yeah. Yeah, that that's that captures it exactly and that that's what i'm saying i think I think now that there's uh, yet another lockdown, I mean, imagine people in, in Victoria going through, is it their fifth lockdown? Uh, and some people are saying, you know, um, we're climbing the walls now, this is too much. Uh, uh, we didn't think we'd have to do this again. But actually, the fact that it's now become really uncomfortable for a mm. lot of people. And by the way, I'm not setting aside the significance of the health issues pandemic is horrible for people who contract the virus and it's horrible for people who've lost their businesses and suffered great economic hardship. But more, more generally, the fact that it's now become even more uncomfortable for us will turn out, won't feel like it now, but retrospectively, it will turn out to be good that we had to suffer a bit more pain, uh, a little bit more disruption to our lives in order to take quite a leap potentially towards that greater level of maturity that you just described um, because there is no escape from the idea that we are doing this for each other 
we're not locked in our homes for our own benefit. Of course, we are protecting ourselves, that's true. But actually what we're doing is making a sacrifice for the common good. And that's a breakthrough idea, which when we're younger, we often don't uh, think in those terms. Uh, it, is, it is all about me and me getting ahead and what I want and my happiness and my comfort and prosperity and all those things. It's a bit, there's a very interesting graph of uh, the experience of life satisfaction through the life cycle, which shows that life satisfaction is very high in childhood, tends to drop through late adolescence and early adulthood down into our 40s, which is why so many people experience the midlife crisis, because then the graph starts to turn upwards again. And people in their 50s and 60s and 70s typically report a deeper sense of life satisfaction than they were experiencing in their 20s, 30s and 40s. This is something for younger people to look forward to. And it's all about this point that you're making. And it's all about arriving at a point of greater maturity, you might even say wisdom or anyway, accumulated experience, which leads us to understand that actually it's not all about me. Uh, that, that I am inseparable from everyone else. We are part, the virus knows this, we are all part of one species. You know, the virus is not only attacking Buddhists over the age of 45, uh, it's humans, mm. because we are one species. And understanding the oneness, yes. understanding yes. our unity, our common humanity, I think that's why later in life, as we come to a deep un deeper understanding of that, there is more satisfaction to be had from life because our priorities change. Mm. Uh, not always. This is not, I mean, talking about a typical pattern, not a universal pattern, but it's true that the focus shifts, as you said, from me to us. Mm. Uh, we become, and, and the breakthrough in human maturity is always mm. when we mm. realize that, 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 the greatest contribution we can make, the most satisfying life we can have is a life lived for others rather than lived for the self. So this kindness revolution in which we uh, become more considerate of our fellow human beings, we understand our mutual connectedness. We've had this circuit breaker through the pandemic and through lockdown to appreciate that more acutely. Do you think it's permanent? Can you see us take, taking this forward? I, I suppose you, you made the comment in your book that the, the people in 1919, I think it was 19, yeah, around about that time, going through the Spanish flu, were well positioned to do that because they'd just come off the back of World War I in which they'd already come together as a nation who were all suffering together. Do, yes. do you think the lessons that we're learning now, and perhaps you can succinctly describe what those lessons are, do yes. you think they're going to be with us into the future? That's my great hope. I did see a cartoon recently of two women talking about their experience of the pandemic and one saying to the other, I can't wait for the time when I can forget all that stuff I learned about myself during the lockdown. Uh, well, my, my great hope with this new book is that we won't forget it. And looking back, there is some comfort from history. I mean, people who lived through the Great Depression, for example, which was a time of hardship far greater, didn't have the health uh, issues that we have now, but in terms of hardship, unemployment, economic uh, uh, struggle, etc., far greater than anything we can imagine now with far less social support yes. uh, than yes. we're given uh, now. Uh, but the people who lived through that often looked back on it and said, was the worst time of my life, uh, hardship, deprivation, sacrifice. We really literally didn't know if we were going to be able to put a meal on the table for the kids some nights, and we were only able to do so because the neighbours pitched in and so on. Uh, but when they looked back on it 20 or 30 or even 50 years later, what they very typically said was that was the making of us. We learned values by having to overcome the hardship, the deprivation of that period which have never left us. We got our priorities straight. In particular, we discovered the value of the neighbourhood and looking out for each other. 
and that remained true. And they became they, they became famous in their families as the people who would never throw out a piece of string. And uh, they, mm. they were the ones yeah. who would always bake a cake if someone new moved into the street and go and mm. welcome them mm. to the street and so on. Practices that have unfortunately mainly died out. Yes. Um, yes. So that so that was a big a big enough disruption to be life changing for those people. So the question is, is this a big enough disruption mm. to be the circuit breaker, as you put it, for all the trends that I was describing a moment ago. I'm optimistic about this, Ian, because I think we have seen a revival of neighbourhoods. We've seen neighbours looking out for each other, perhaps even meeting each other for the first time as a result of having to live through um, the, the deprivations of the pandemic, thinking a bit more about the frail elderly and people who are socially isolated. In fact, that, I think, is the, the, the second uh, effect that I'd point to that by all of us experiencing a tiny taste of what it's like to be socially isolated, perhaps we've sharpened our appreciation of what people who are permanently at risk of social isolation really have to face. Uh, I think a third uh, effect that could stay with us is that we experienced a kind of enforced stress buster and many of us have thought, well, we don't have to run so hard. We don't have to go to the office every day. Maybe we can, we can work from home sometimes if we have that kind of job. We don't need to run quite so hard. We didn't need to do all those trips that we had to cancel. We didn't need to buy all that stuff that we would have bought if the shops had been open. So there's a bit of revision of those things going on. And I think a, another big effect has been our... our utter reliance on information technology, uh, which has made us even more appreciative of that technology and grateful for the fact that we live in this period in history, that we can contact each other via Zoom or even email and texts and Instagram and yeah. Facebook and so on. But also, uh, did you notice how after the last lockdown, how impatient people were to get back together uh, to make eyeball contact? Uh, this, this uh, I think, has been a powerful reminder that the technology is brilliant and very much a second best option. We need each other. We need, we need human presence. And I think we've been vividly reminded of that. So I'm, I'm hoping that we are going to carry some of these lessons, internalise some of these lessons and, and generalise them more, become more caring, become yes. a bit more yes. attentive to people around us who are in need, a bit more alert to people who are socially isolated, a bit more neighbourly. Yes. And gradually, yes. you know, if enough of us decided that, that, that this has been a good lesson, that we're proud of how we have looked out for each other and made sacrifices for the common good during this period, it's a good way to live. Why do we stop? Why wouldn't it be pathetic to stop? Why don't we just go on living like that? That's how a revolution starts, just enough individuals starting to change, starting to say, well, kindness uh, is the natural core human quality because we're social creatures, because we need um, social harmony, we need communities to sustain us, all those things we were talking about before. Kindness is the magic ingredient. And luckily we have that innate, we all have that innate capacity for kindness. Why not exercise it? You can uh, make an impact simply by smiling and saying hello when you pass someone in the street, simply by chatting about the weather to someone who's looking a bit lost or lonely. Uh, by being a better listener. I mean, the, 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 single, the single biggest step we could take as individuals in the direction of a kindness revolution would be to become uh, more attentive and empathic listeners. Listening is the great gift that we give people, which says to them, I take you seriously. I'm listening yeah. to you. Yeah. I'm noticing you. I appreciate you. Your chapter on listening, I thought was absolutely brilliant. Can, can you unpack that a little bit more mm. for us here? Mm. Yes, well, listening, of course, doesn't come naturally. Kindness comes naturally to us, but the manifestation of kindness, which is the, probably the most potent manifestation of it, which is listening, uh, doesn't come naturally to us because we're all so preoccupied with what we believe about politics or religion or culture or something else. We, we, we've, we've put together 
uh, what I describe in the book as a kind of mind cage, a framework that we build around ourselves, which, which captures all our knowledge and beliefs and attitudes and values and so on. And of course, we feel comfortable within that little, it's like a cocoon. We feel comfortable within that. The problem is that once we've constructed our little mind cage, we don't see the world, we don't easily see what's going on out there in the world. We see it all filtered through the framework of our own attitudes and beliefs, which is why people tend to see what they're looking for and to get reinforcement from what people are saying to them, even if it, 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 it could be a challenge to what they believe. So when we listen to someone, it's a courageous act. It's an act of supreme kindness to say, I'm going to step outside the comfort and security of my personal mind cage, and I'm going to try to imagine what it must be like to be you. I'm actually going to entertain your ideas. I'm not going to react. I will react eventually, but first I'm not going to react. I'm just going to make sure I understand what you're saying, and I'm probably going to have to prove that to you by playing it back to you. Is this what you're saying? Have I got this straight? Um, that is, when we listen like that, it does require courage because, of course, we are running the risk of being changed by what we hear, and that's a risk some of us aren't easily able to take. But the, but the unspoken message when we listen attentively to someone is, I take you seriously enough to entertain what you're saying to me. And if I don't listen properly or if I listen half-heartedly or I look distracted and I look at my watch or something, the unspoken message is, I'm sorry, I don't take you seriously enough to understand and appreciate what you're trying to say. That, that's something we'd never put into words with a partner or a colleague or a neighbour or a child or a friend. And yet it's what we, it's the message we convey whenever we withhold the gift of listening. It's the same thing uh, when we are reluctant to apologise for something that we've done that's hurt or offended someone else. By withholding the apology, we're saying, I don't take you seriously enough to bother apologising. Now, that's another sign of kindness to apologise and to forgive generously yes. is yes. a sign of kindness. That, again, says, I understand your need of my forgiveness and I'm giving it to you generously. So... Um, there are these there are these ways in which we can express kindness in everyday living that doesn't require. I mean, dr dramatic actions like Andrew's are brilliant uh, and wonderful and lift the spirits. But we can do it uh, every day with the people we encounter in perhaps quieter, um, um, less dramatic ways, but still with the potential that every act of kindness has the potential to be therapeutic for the person who receives our act of kindness and in that way to make the world a better place. Sometimes mm -hmm. it involves offering someone a bed for the night or cooking them a meal or asking them out for a cup of coffee or something that, 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 that is a, a big gesture like that. And sometimes it's just listening to someone at the bus stop who has a need to, to talk. Hugh, should this kindness and this listening be offered universally? What about people who are toxic or just piss us off, frankly? What do we do with these people? How Do we bother showing kindness to them or just walk away and focus on the positives? There are circumstances in relationships um, where the relationship becomes so toxic that it's in the interests of both parties that they should separate. I'm not denying that for a moment. But in terms of the run of our everyday life, one of the most, I think one of the loveliest things about being human, one of the most dramatic things to say about our species is that we have this capacity for kindness, regardless of how we feel about other people. Kindness, I think, of, as a form of human love, all forms of human love are wonderful. But kindness is like the purest form of human love because it actually doesn't require affection. It's not an emotional state. It's something that I do for you because you are a fellow human and perhaps because at this moment you're in need mm. of a friendly word or a helping hand or a mm. listening ear or whatever it might be. So we are capable of kindness towards people we don't like. 
uh, Samuel Johnson wrote a lovely thing about 250 years ago when he said, kindness is in our power, even when fondness is not. And I think that's, you know, we should sort of write that in our brains. You don't have to like someone to be kind. You don't have to agree with someone to be kind. You, you see someone in need. Uh, you don't say, oh, look, I see you need a helping hand. But, but tell me, how did you vote in the last election? You know, I need to be sure we're on the same wavelengths with politics before I agree. Of course, we don't do that. Someone's in in a jam, we help them out. That's a wonderful thing about humans. We don't have to like them. We don't have to agree with them. We don't even have to know them in order to display acts of kindness. And I think it is a discipline in, uh, to, to, um, to draw on our uh, reserves of uh, our capacity for kindness. And I think a good way of encouraging that discipline is to make it a subject, a focus of nightly reflection at the end of the day, just in a quiet moment to say, I wonder if I could have been a bit kinder today. I wonder if the way I handled that was as kind as it could have been, because it's possible to do, I mean, being kind doesn't mean being soft in the head. Kind people are not pushovers. You can you can express your view forcefully, but still kindly. You can terminate a relationship kindly. You can discipline a child kindly. You can have a robust argument kindly. Um, it doesn't it doesn't require uh, anything other than the realization that we are humans responsible for the level of social harmony where we live, and this is the biggest contribution we can make to that. Yes, yes. Paraphrasing what you said in your book, uh, kindness puts legs on love. Love can be this ethereal, you know, glossy concept, but kindness is quite practical. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and yes, I is, mean, romantic love is exciting, and familial love is remarkable, and companionate love is a fundamental to our uh, emotional health and so on. But kindness is this other as you say, intensely practical expression of the human capacity for love, which is unemotional. And I think that's the breakthrough. You don't have to feel anything. You just have to exercise your true, essential humanity. Well, I've been talking with Dr. Hugh Mackay, who has just published his most recent book, The Kindness Revolution. Uh, Hugh is the author of 22 books, not just nonfiction books, but also a collection of fiction books and uh, encourage you to dip into the catalogue and, and read some of that and become more aware of what it means to be human and connect with other people. Thank you for what you have done for so many of us in your writings. And it's been an absolute pleasure and joy to talk with you. Thank you, Hugh Mackay. Thank you very much, Ian. I'm very grateful for your interest in the new book. Thank you.